five minutes after 10 o'clock. Thank you for tuning in. We all have our own opinions about life and, and life beyond life and, and uh, spirit realms and all that stuff. And a lot, a lot of our opinions are based on our religious upbringing and a lot of it is, even our religious upbringing sometimes changed somewhat just simply by life and you wonder okay i wonder if that part is true and, and if this part is true but ultimately you know i i think none of us really know i, I however um we all whenever the subject comes up we all have our thoughts and our stories and so for example yesterday we had kreskin on the amazing kreskin and 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 he he came right out and said look i, I can't see talk to people on the other side um but he said he could read minds he could read minds he wasn't he said that's not a trick that's a real thing he can do and so i believe him i believe he can and you know why because i had one <laughs> moment when i was much younger i was half asleep and and i saw a lady calling me like i was dreaming and i knew her and i knew she was calling me and it wasn't when i say i knew i mean i knew and so I wasn't predicting the future. I was just communicating somehow with my mind. So, so if that's possible, I mean, I don't know if is like for example, could could you if you had enough money, could you pay some scientists to develop a a whole like a hundred robots that could live and work together and and try to provide for themselves the same way we do, but they could never see or hear or detect you. Like, could you be in their presence without them ever knowing it? Of course. Of course they could build a robot like that, right? Mm -hmm. So who's to say that God didn't do that and, and the angels didn't? And who, who's to say that we aren't those robots unable to detect the the, the creators and, and angels around us? Who knows? Don't think I've gone off the deep end. I'm just, you know, thinking out loud. And, you know... Um, when we heard about Dr. Rick Sheff from one of our publicists, I said, gosh, this is the perfect topic. I love this. And he has studied this way more than I ever have. I just kind of wonder about it. You know, when I'm go going from one place to another, I'm in my car. I think, I wonder, you know, especially when somebody dies. You know, you think yeah. about these things, right? Um, Dr. Sheff is a family physician. We'll start there. He's a uh, the principal and chief medical officer of the Greeley Company. When he was 60, he professed vows as a monk in the spirit of peace, interfaith, monastic community. I don't know if he's still a monk. I'm thinking about being a monk. <laughs> he's also a consultant, a lecturer, and the author of the book called Joyfully Shattered, A Physician's Awakening at the Crossroads of Science and Spirituality. Dr. Rick Sheff, I love this topic. Good morning, sir. How are you? Good morning. How are you, Harris? Good. Where are you calling from? Uh, right now, I'm calling from St. Louis. I've been here working with a hospital because I work as a consultant with hospitals and healthcare organizations all across the country. And uh, on my way to an airport, as soon as we finish. So, are, as a physician, did you change the way you feel about some of the things I was talking about, the spirit realms and, and God and things like that? And 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 were you ever an atheist or an agnostic? Well, change is an understatement. I was raised in a family that I describe in the book as passionately atheist. And I was recently speaking to my father, who's 90 years old now, and I, he knows about the book, and he, I said, well, I describe our family as passionately atheist, and he said, absolutely, still am. So that's the upbringing I had, and I will tell you, I knew that to be the truth into my 20s. But uh, as I say in the book, I'm a scientist. I'm a skeptic. I always wonder, how do you know that? How, how do you know? And I've deeply studied that, including philosophy at Oxford in addition to the sciences and medicine I've studied. And I've come to the conclusion that when you ask that question and keep asking and go where, I'll call it the data goes, my conclusion is the world is a far more wondrous and mysterious place yeah. than most of today's scientists are telling us. And and most of our theo theologians, whatever, how do you pronounce that word? I, I think both sides, the scientists and the religious people, are looking for answers. And I, I like it when the two come together. When When somehow you're able to take science and say, gosh, this, this seems to be true. Do you know what I wondered, as a scientist, what is the answer to this question? 
what is intelligence? Just to, I mean, the basic, the basic argument is there intelligent design. Even if you don't want to say God, even if you don't want to bring the Bible or Jesus or Buddha or Muhammad into the st- picture, just talk about intelligent design. I mean, clearly, this looks like an intelligent design to me, <laughs> this thing I'm, I look at, you know, this thing called life. So then what, what is intelligence? So that's a, a wonderful question, because I would actually reframe that a little differently. Because I think what you were getting at, and we're groping with words, and words are inadequate to describe the phenomena that I believe underpin what we see. And we live our lives, we live day to day, I live day to day, you do, we get in our cars, we go places, we we recognize this world exists and is real, and then we have glimpses into other aspects that the world works in some ways the way we think it does in other ways it doesn't and so the term I prefer instead of intelligence is consciousness because that's really we might think of it as thinking we might think of it as feeling being aware but there is this phenomenon of consciousness we all participate in it and it's the greatest mystery of all well, it is consciousness, and and if but but there's also intelligence. I mean, there's there, well, put it this way: the word intelligent design, the second word design. There's clearly design. It, it, I I agree with you. There is design in the sense that our consciousness, including our logic, which is a subset of our consciousness, can look at, study through science, which I deeply respect and and, uh, and value, and say, wow, isn't that phenomenal? that the way I think, I come up with a mathematical equation, and look, it predicts the way the planets move around the sun. That's a pretty phenomenal connection between the way (laughs) one person objectively thinks and the way our solar system works. Right, (laughs) right, right. That's pretty (laughs) interesting. I never thought of it that way before. Uh, You also talk about um, telepathic communication. How does that fit into what that's you're what speaking I about? Accidentally. Yes. And, yeah, that, that's something I, you know, when I grew up uh, an atheist, I knew that was impossible. And I really understand the skeptics who call themselves the debunkers of these, you know, unusual phenomena uh, in whatever way we think of them, paranormal, etc. But when you have the experience, or in my case, I witnessed the experience, it changes you. So I'll share that story, which is uh, one of the earlier experiences I had, and I came to call these data points as a scientist would look at them. Uh, my first wife was pregnant with our first child, and, uh, and she was about seven months pregnant. One of her dearest friends was two months further along than her. The connection I saw that happened between them through that pregnancy was absolutely mind-blowing. They just got it together in a way that I couldn't grasp is how they understood how they were feeling, etc. Well, uh, friend, Susan, uh, I call her in the book because I've changed names in the book, uh, goes past her due date, gets kind of depressed, and uh, Marcia, as I call her in the, in the book, is, uh, is trying to help her. And One morning, 4.30 in the morning, Marcia sits bolt up right in bed next to me and goes, Rick, Rick, wake up. Susan is in labor. I'm going, what? what? No, Susan is in labor. I know there's energy coursing through my whole body. Susan is in labor. Oh, wow. All right. Call her. I can't call her. It's 4.30 in the morning, so she tried to get back to sleep. It was, you know, and it took her quite a while to get back to sleep. She was so energized. She got up the next morning. She's wondering, should I call Susan? Should I not? Susan calls and says, guess what? I'm in labor. Oh, wow. And Marcia says, I know. Oh, that's Turns amazing. Out, Susan was awakened with her first contraction at 4.30. Susan didn't know she was in labor until 5 when she had a series of contractions. Marcia knew at 4.30. Oh, wow. I now, love I'm that a, story. I'm a skeptic, and I witnessed that, and Marcia witnessed that, and we have confirmation of it. We weren't dreaming. We'd, and I go, wait a minute. I love if that story. that happened, and I tell that story in the book. The book is all about stories. These are the stories that I experienced. This is my journey that transformed me 
from a passionate atheist, still being a scientist, to someone who says, wow, spirituality, and I take it in a very generic sense, not a denominational or sectarian sense, spirituality is true, and science is increasingly showing us that. And I think that's the coming new paradigm. I think that's where we're headed. I think so. I and, think so. You know, that, I call that a data point, and when data and theory don't agree, the data wins. you got to follow the data if you're a good scientist. Uh, okay, and not to name drop, but yesterday we had a famous guy on, and you know Kreskin, we, I think I mentioned him in the intro, and, and he, we asked him, what do, do you believe in the supernatural? And his answer was interesting. He said, I think this, what we call the supernatural is just the natural that we don't understand yet. Mm-hmm. So I um, totally agree. That, I think that's exactly where science is headed. Yeah. Let's take a little break and be right back. Uh, I love this conversation. The book is called um, Joyfully Shattered, A Physician's Awakening at the Crossroads of Science and Spirituality. We'll take a break and be right back. Career Source, Citrus Levy Marion, brings together business and community partners, economic development leaders, and educational providers to connect employers with qualified, skilled talent, and job seekers with employment and career development opportunities. Tune in the first and third Wednesday of each month at 9.30 a.m. to Career Source, Citrus Levy Marion, and learn how they can help you. The weather is brought to you by MyFWC.com. Safe boating is no accident. It'll be mostly cloudy Thursday with a high in the 60s to near 70. Cloudy Thursday night with some rain late. Lows ranging from the mid-50s inland to the low 60s on the coast. Friday rather cloudy and becoming windy with periods of rain and a thunderstorm in the morning. Then a brief shower or two in the afternoon. The high 72 to 76. Saturday mostly sunny. High 72 to 76. From the Florida Weather Center, I'm meteorologist Joe Lundberg. Hi, this is JP from Penn Flooring here in Ocala. I would like to invite you to come in and visit our spacious showroom where we have solutions for every style and budget. From wall-to-wall carpet to hardwood floors and tiles, we have an unsurpassed selection of flooring. At Penn Flooring, we've provided quality customer service with a family touch for over 25 years. Visit our website at penflooring.com or come by our showroom, 1201 Southwest 17th Street, just over the bridge. Penn Flooring, quality customer service with a family touch. All right, 17 minutes after 10 o'clock, let's continue with this uh, fascinating conversation with Dr. Rick Sheff. The book is called Joyfully Shattered. You might have already uh, picked up on what the title uh, implies. And to me, it implies, I'm going to ask him if, if I'm right, it, it implies that he was, he's happy that his belief was shattered. Am I right about that, doctor? That's true. And uh, the, the title really comes from uh, two pieces. One, uh, as a student of philosophy, I I took very seriously the question of how do we know the truth? And in my studies, I came across a concept known as the web of belief. Uh, One of the famous uh, Harvard philosopher coined that phrase, uh, Willard Van Norman Quine, and it really says that every one of us lives our lives, functions, in the context of a collection of beliefs that are all interconnected, often mutually reinforcing. It's what we take to be the truth about the world. You have your web of belief, I have mine. Some of them are shared collective webs of belief in our culture, in our religions. But every claim about what is true is embedded in a web of belief. And so I had the web of belief I grew up with, Mm -hmm. and I knew to be the truth in the 20s. And then when you encounter something that doesn't fit your web of belief, as I did, and that experience with Marsha being a great example, you have a choice. This is how human nature works. We're wired this way in our psychology. You can either say, that's not data. That's coincidence. By the way, I shared that story with a fellow physician, and he said, coincidence. I'm going, what? The odds against that wow. are so great to call that coincidence. But, but that's human nature. You don't it is. It is data. It is. And, there's and then the second is to say, well, it makes data but it doesn't change anything. It sort of hangs out on the okay. periphery of my web of belief, or it may come to the core and shatter your web, and that's what happened to the, me the, over the, a 40-year journey. So I have a thought on, on what you just said there, and, and if somebody says it's just a coincidence, the one person who knows something different than any of us is your wife, because she, in her mind, she knew it. She was telling you what she knew, not what she wondered, but what she knew. 
and and that to me is the only thing you you can't you can't eavesdrop on somebody else's thought. Well, I guess you can eavesdrop, but I mean you can't. I don't know. I don't know how. You, you, okay, let, let me change thoughts here. Atheists often will say, "I don't need to believe in a god." in order to act good and treat my fellow human beings with kindness and loving. I don't need that. I can do that without that. And I've said, of course, of course you don't need that. And and, and, you, and, a, and a believer in God doesn't necessarily make the best person on the planet either. You know, you, you can have plenty of people who believe in God who are horrible people and plenty of people who don't believe in God who are wonderful people. But, but I think if there's an, an intelligence to this whole thing or a consciousness, as you say, or design, as we both agree, then there's probably a reason for it. And and if the reason is ultimate perfection, if, if God, for example, wants us as, as a life form to somehow be better than we are now, and, and maybe right now we're better than we were before, then, it, then even an atheist would agree, yeah, that's what I want too. <laughs> so it's kind of like we're on the same page with that one, you know? Well, we can be, and and here's something, and I struggle with this, and I'm very transparent, I share this part of my journey in the book, uh, is how do we find a foundation for how we should live a good life, treat others, because we have seen how misused religion has been right. to motivate anything other than loving behavior. Beautiful, how, yes. Uh, you know, so, and I'm going... I, I, and that's when I went to Oxford. It was with the burning passion of a young man to find a foundation for that that is unshakable. So I could look at someone and say, "What you're doing is wrong. It's immoral, and here's why." Rather than, "Oh, it's just art, historical, cultural, relativistic, etc." And you go, "No, no there's got to be something deeper than that." And I found in the academic studies, no answers. And I actually walked away from Oxford, walked away from an Oxford degree hmm. to say I got to find them in living, in practicing medicine, in in being in the world. And that again, I share the stories in the book of how I got to a foundation that says our very essence is love, and that's why we are the way we are. And uh, when you practice medicine, all of your patients aren't the same religion, and some don't have religions, and you've really had to study everything and keep science in the forefront to see if everything works with each other. It's so true. When, when you practice medicine, you are privileged because people bring to you their deepest vulnerability. They are sick. They are in pain. They are in fear. They are dying. And, and they look to you as their physician. Yes, they want your technical competence, but they want more than that. And I tell stories of that in the book about patients. I was, I had been with the story of a young boy, six months old, and worked and being with his family through his illness and consensually his death. And what they needed from me as his doctor and their doctor, as their family doctor, was so much more than just the technical competence. That's what we all want in our physician. And we need physicians who, 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 have this within their very being. The term for it is, is we need a bio, psycho, social, spiritual model of medicine, of healthcare, of how we mm. see patients, treat them. That's the right way to do this. In, in the notes, it says that you took a vow as a as a monk. Um, in I don't know if you're still doing that vow or exercising that or not. But but I mean, during that time, which might still be now. Did doing that uh, elevate you to a different level of consciousness? So the story of how I became a monk and the, <laughs> the title of that chapter is Brother Rick? Subtitle. <laughs> I didn't see this one coming. <laughs> and and what, what, what happened was uh, I began to more and more deeply, I learned to pray, and I shared those stories in the book about prayer and the deepening of my prayers, and in fact, many of the chapters are punctuated with the prayer as I would express it at that stage in my journey, and so you can watch the evolution of my prayer life in the book as my, as you said, consciousness grows, expands, deepens my connection to spirituality, and the prayers change dramatically. Well, I found myself at a point where 
I believe our consciousness can affect others through prayer, through intention. I think there's good science behind that. And I found myself in a deeply prayerful way every day, praying for the world, praying for everyone I knew, praying for the whole world, for peace, for all that stuff. And uh, it turns out, a group, and I shared information about it, Celebrating Life Ministries in the book, uh, has a monastic order whose primary commitment is to pray for the world two hours a day. And at one point, the, uh, the leader of that group calls me up in one of our retreat settings and asks me if I am interested, willing to become a monk and make that a commitment, not just something I was doing, but I commit to do huh. that every day. And I was going, whoa, wait a minute. Yeah, right, right, <laughs> and I had a six-month novitiate period in which I tried it out, and I shared those stories in there, and I think about not doing it, doing it. Mm-hmm. And finally, I, I say, and, and there's something called Pascal's Wager, where he says, look, either uh, Pascal was a mathematician in around 1500s, and he says, you know, either God exists or doesn't exist. And if God exists and I don't believe in him, bad things are going to happen. If God exists and I believe in him and I act a good life, good things will happen. I'll go to heaven. If God doesn't exist and I act a good life, then uh, I'll live a good life, and then I'll die and nothing happens. Hmm. And if God doesn't exist and I live a bad life and go after everything I want, so I'll have some, you know, some pleasures in, the, in this brief life. He says, if I've got a wager, uh, an eternity in hell, which I don't believe in hell, but that's a personal belief. But that's what he was thinking. Because if God exists and I live a bad life, I, you know, I'm going to go on the side of, I'm going to wager that God exists, and therefore I'll live that kind of good life. Well, I had that thought about, does our prayer, our consciousness, help others? Because if it does, would I commit to a lifetime there you go. That's of all. praying on behalf of that's, others? That is really it. That's a, that's a big part. It's hard to really understand how that even makes a difference. Um, you know, I, I, real quick, I wish we had more time, but uh, the, the, the phrase believe in, I've always been fascinated by that phrase because I, I p- people who believe in me, um, th- you don't have to ask, do I exist? And so, like, do you believe in God or do you believe he exists is really two different things. Um, so if you believe he exists, you could also not believe in him. I believe he exists, but I don't believe in him. What do you mean? Well, I mean, I do believe in him. But, exactly. Uh, but but I mean, if you... If you to, to believe in somebody, if I believe in you, for example, and, and you say, "Can I borrow your car?" Yeah, sure, I believe in you, <laughs> right? Right? <laughs> it doesn't mean I believe you exist. You know? Do you know what I mean? Well, so I mean, there's a question: Does God exist? And they said, "What do you mean by God?" And there are so many ways of of trying to put into human language the thought of of some ultimate yeah. being and right. consciousness, and the thought that any one of us in our language in our culture, in our particular religion, can encompass all of that, I do not find, as a scientist and a serious philosopher, holds water. I think there are many, and, and I say this, one of the, uh, well, one of the, th- there are many paths to whatever this ultimate is, and as long as they're about love and, and spirituality and caring for others and yourself and living a good life, there are many paths to call it God. Call it the Buddhists have no God, but it's all the same. But but it, but there and are messages. The but way there, it all works. But if there but if there is a God, and God wants us to know about Him, then he probably messengers is the way we learn about Him. And, yeah, I, I'm with you on that one. And you may be one of them. And and Jesus is certainly one of them. And. Yes. And there are other people who are on TV squinting their eyes asking for money, and I don't believe they're one of them. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe that's part of it. Um, I loved this conversation, and I uh, have to say goodbye, but let's give the, uh, get the book um, information. Uh, do you have a website? I do. It's www.rickchefmd.com, and it's S-H-E-F-F, no C. I told my wife every time... For the rest of your life, you're going to say that's Chef S H E F F No C. And Robin makes it easy. It's already on the guest list for today for, on WOCA.com. Dr. Rick Chef, that was fascinating. I loved it. We'll be right back. Fox News Radio. I'm Lillian Wu. Oscar nods are out, and The Revenant racks up the most nominations. 
12, including Best Actor for Leonardo DiCaprio, up for Best Supporting Actor. Christian Bale in The Big Short. Tom Hardy in The Revenant. Mark Ruffalo in Spotlight. Mark Rylance in Bridge of Spies. And Sylvester Stallone.